Hello and welcome to the next lecture, The Social Media Ecosystem and Your Targeted Audience. Uh, today we're going to talk about lots of different formats and uh, different kinds of social media. We're going to define social media and we're going to talk about some ways that you need to engage with social media and your buyers. So there are thousands of social media tools out there. Um, it's basically a jungle. There are lots of different formats. There are some social media sites that survived for a few months and died. There are some that started early on uh, in the social media world and are still surviving and thriving. So uh, it's a social media jungle and this presentation is going to help provide a framework and a foundation for you to help learn how to survive it. So here are lots of the different social media categories. On this slide you'll see sort of uh, some of the more popular uh, categories and then we're going to talk about some of the tools that fall under each one of these categories so you can understand their capabilities and their appropriate uses. So here is the list. Uh, keep these in mind as we move through them. But before we get to that, let's first define what social media is in the first place. Uh, what you see on the slide is actually David Meerman Scott's uh, definition of social media. The way people share ideas, contents, thoughts, and their relationships online. Social media differ from so-called mainstream media in that anyone can create, comment on, and add to social media content. Social media can take the form of text, audio, video, images, and communities. So as you can see, it's quite a broad definition. And it's very important to think about social media not in terms of the different technologies and tools, but how those different tools allow you to communicate. And that's how we end up dividing social media into the different categories. It's what those social media uh, um, elements and formats do and how they allow you to communicate. We also need to clarify the difference between social media and social networking. Those are two terms that are used interchangeably, um, often used incorrectly. So let's get a grasp of that. So social media, you need to think about as sort of the umbrella term. It is sort of the overarching term to describe this whole area. It's basically how people communicate online in a social way. So then we have social networking. And social networking is a subset of social media. So people um, usually uh, do social networking with sites like Facebook, um, Twitter. This is where people create a personal profile and then interact and become part of a community of sort of like-minded people. So social media is the big overarching term. And social networking is kind of a subset of social media. So, social media, as David Meerman Scott likes to put it, is a cocktail party. So ask yourself, if you were at, at an actual cocktail party, um, how would you behave if you were the owner of a business? Do you go up to strangers and say, hey, buy my product? Do you ask everybody for a business card before you talk to them? Do you listen more than you speak? Are you helpful? Do you provide valuable information without expecting some kind of return? Do you try to meet every single person or do you have a few great conversations? Or do you avoid social interaction altogether? Sure, you can go to a cocktail party and you can treat everybody as a sales lead while babbling on about what your company does and what your price point is, but you will not win any popularity contests and probably not many customers either. The popular people on the cocktail circuit are the ones who really know how to make friends. They develop good relationships with people and they introduce friends to other people. The same holds true for social media. So think about it like a cocktail party. So I'd like you to watch this uh, video, Is Social Media a Fad? Uh, when you get an opportunity, kind of take a look and you'll see some, I think, kind of startling statistics and information, some things that may really surprise you. Um, this will give you a good context as we move forward in talking about social media. So basically the four ways that people end up engaging with social media can be broken down like this. We communicate, we collaborate, we educate, or we entertain. So keep those four different purposes in mind as we move through the different categories of social media and how they're used. So number one would be social networking. 
um, as we kind of alluded to earlier. These are tools that help you interact with other people, to share interests and hobbies with friends, colleagues, and other people. So examples of this would be Facebook, LinkedIn, um, MySpace and Friendster have transformed a little bit. At the beginning of the lecture we talked about how some of the early sites have come and gone. Some have come and transformed into something completely different. Friendster is an example of that. It started out as kind of a, more of a Facebook-like format. Now it's a gaming site. MySpace was also very similar to Facebook and what Facebook tried to do. Um, it is now more of a music sharing site. It was actually purchased by Justin Timberlake and he's trying to use it to help promote new music talent. Next are the tools that we would call in the publishing category and these are things that facilitate uh, email campaigns, blogging, wikis, some of the more popular tools here would be blogger.com, Wikipedia, WordPress, and SlideShare. Next we have photo sharing and I think there's one obvious site that we need to add here that has really grown in popularity over the last couple of years. Basically these tools give you the ability to archive and share photos. Um, the examples on the screen you see Flickr, Photobucket, and Picasa and I think we also need to add Instagram to that. Um, one of the probably most popular photo sharing sites currently. Next we have audio and this sort of gives you the ability to download and carry things like songs and podcasts. So examples of tools in this category would be iTunes, Rhapsody, maybe even Spotify. The next category would be video and this allows you to share the same kind of content that you have on your TV screen and view it over computers or mobile phones. So sites like Google Video, Hulu and YouTube are probably some of the more popular video sharing sites. If you like to communicate something interesting and meaningful in 140 characters or less, microblogging is probably a good choice for you. Um, Twitter is probably the most popular form of microblogging currently. Um, there's also a couple of other sites out there, but um, again, Twitter is, is probably the reigning champion of this particular format right now. Live casting basically encompasses, oh, we jumped ahead, let me go back. There we go. Live casting um, allows you to stream a live broadcast to an audience or some other social network. So things like Blog Talk Radio, Live 365, and Shoutcast would be examples of live casting. Then we have virtual worlds, and some of you may have some experience with Second Life. I know there are some professors at Arkansas State who have um, tinkered with this a little bit. But basically businesses are also using this to set up virtual storefronts to try to um, help people do commerce in a virtual world. Sun Microsystems actually is a company that uses virtual campus for, for their, their employees to meet and collaborate on projects. So again, Active Worlds would be one format. Second Life is probably the most uh, familiar uh, virtual worlds format. Then we have gaming. And gamers are typically very loyal um, on online communities and they spend hours playing in these environments and have shared experiences and shared conversations across continents sometimes. Um, some of the more popular sites for this would be Halo and World of Warcraft. Then we get to productivity applications and these help enhance business productivity in one way or another. One example of this would be BitTorrent which helps deliver really large files through the internet. The pirates also like this because they tend to do things like deliver movies um, illegally through BitTorrent sites. Um, Google Docs would be another example. So would uh, survey sites like SurveyMonkey and Zoomerang. Then we have aggregators, and aggregators help you sort of collect information, organize it, store it for easy access. Um, a lot of times they can also really tell you what the buzz is about your particular product, service, or industry. So they're really good for capturing market intelligence. Sites would be uh, in this category are things like Dig, Google Reader, and My Yahoo. Then we go to RSS, and I've heard two different explanations for RSS and what RSS stands for. 
The most popular is real simple syndication. And what this does is um, instead of you having to go back and visit a website every day to see if anything has changed or new content has been posted, if you sign up for an RSS feed, it keeps up with the changes for you. So when new content gets posted, you're typically sent an email to say, hey, alert, there's new content here, here's a link, so that you don't have to keep going back and visiting that website to see if they've updated or not. RSS does that for you. One of the most popular uh, formats here would be RSS 2.0. Then there's a category that we call search and the term you know Google has become synonymous with searching and people say Google it well you may be using Yahoo search but um, everybody knows what it means to Google something to help you find people places and things that you're looking for. Um, another site that I wanted to point out in this particular category is Technorati. Um, and Technorati is a blog um, indexing system so it helps track um, and index blogs and helps rate um, what they call their authority or their influence. So if you have a good Technorati score that means you've got a blog that lots of people read and pay attention to and comment on. Then we have mobile. So a lot of the tools that we've talked about today are accessible via your phone. Um, and there are also specific tools that make your mobile phone a more powerful business ally such as AOL Mobile, CallWave, Jot, and SMS. And we have interpersonal tools. These are tools that help facilitate, basically, interpersonal communication, communication between people. So some of these would be AOL Instant Messenger, iChat, GoToMeeting, and Skype. So let's talk about online forums for a minute. Interactive forums used to be places where people discussed particular niche hobbies, um, certain sports, entertainment, and a lot of you know the early days PR and marketing folks kind of saw them as very insignificant places to be they didn't need to be there these were just a bunch of nerds basically up at 3 a.m. talking about things that very few other people were interested in that was the early view of these um, of chat rooms and interactive forums so marketers have kind of slowly and painfully learned that they actually might need to have a presence on some of these spaces. Um, ignoring them can be costly. And one of the examples that um, David Meerman Scott provides in his book deals with Sony. You know, a really large company, um, innovative, you'd think would really be on the cusp of social media and uh, knowing how to use it appropriately and to their advantage. Well, they learned the hard way. Here's what happened. Um, a gentleman named Mark Rasinovich had a blog and it was called um, a post he, he did called Sony Rootkits and Digital Rights Management Gone Too Far. And in his post he detailed and analyzed uh, Sony BMG CDs and their um, the software that they used to manage permissions and uh, for the purchase music. And he said you know what this software has some shortcomings and some problems and actually very easily can be exploited by malicious software viruses. Um, so he showed both the way the software is installed and the lack of an uninstaller utility were very troublesome. Well the reaction to his blog was very quick and it was very dramatic. He got hundreds of comments and people really started uh, commenting negatively about Sony and even threatening to boycott the company. So chat rooms were abuzz. There was all kinds of negative stuff going on about Sony. Reporters and the media started to pick up on this because the buzz was just so loud. Um, but where was Sony? Well, Sony was nowhere to be found. Certainly not on, on any of the online channels. Um, it basically took them five days to respond and when they did respond um, it was one of their global digital business presidents um, who went on NPR's morning edition went on the radio to respond to all of this uh, conflict that was taking place online so um, his choice of radio as a medium to react to was very poor um, he downplayed the issue he made the chat room folks seem uh, you know tried to sort of marginalize them like they're they're not really that important this is not a really big deal it's just a bunch of people in a chat room and you know why should we more worry about that well he they should have worried um, the Texas Attorney General sued Sony 
under a 2005 spyware law that they had, and several other states followed. And as of the publishing of Mr. Scott's book, about 40 states have settled with Sony. Um, and we just don't know what could have happened if Sony had actually joined in the online conversation. They chose not to, and it probably was very costly to their brand at that time. Now, so the lessons that we learned from Sony, you really need to be present. You need to react quickly and honestly, and you need to be in those forums where people are talking about you and responding. You, if you do that, even if it doesn't completely turn a negative situation around, you can be seen as a real person and not this um, nameless, faceless, uncaring organization. You can give a human face to your company. Um, so just by participating, you will contribute to helping make that situation better. What's important is authenticity and honesty. Those are the two most important characteristics for a company to portray on social media sites. So you really need to monitor what's being said. Um, if you leave stuff out there that's negative, if you are dark and not saying a thing online, people start wondering, what's this company hiding? or boy they're just not with it they're not seeing any of this they're completely um, unaware of what's going on I don't know which one is worse both of them are bad just having a presence on blogs and forums and chat rooms that your customers frequent show that you care about the people who are spending money on your products and services so it's best not to wait for a crisis how can you afford not to come closer to your most vocal customers it just makes sense so here's an example of an outcome that was very different from what happened with Sony. Um, this was Nikon, and Nikon introduced a new prosumer camera called the D200 and launched it globally through um, lots of specialty distributors and high-end camera stores, which was their typical method of distribution. But they also did something different this time. They also distributed it through um, retailers like Circuit City and Best Buy they never had really done that before for this kind of camera um, so the supply was very constrained when it first hit the stores people had a hard time getting this camera um, one customer said it named Alan Scott said this the places where camera guys like me normally get Nikon gear were caught out because of lack of supply and the Nikon user community and DPR which is digital photography review these were online chat rooms and blogs they were active and people were just starting to really complain hey can't get a hold of this camera um, one of the first posts said uh, I ordered a D200 from B&H a distributor called B&H um, this afternoon about 430 mountain time the charge was made against my credit card an hour later I got an email that said they had a technical problem and the camera was actually not in stock but they would hold my order and charge for it when they actually got it in stock. I tried canceling the charge. I got an email back on how to handle a disputed charge. I'll see what happens when I call them in the morning. So the crisis continues. Customer Alan Scott said this, within a few hours dozens of posts appeared on the thread and the tone had become very critical of B&H with people complaining that the company was purposefully screwing them. But here was the good news. A B&H employee was actually monitoring those forums um, and became an active participant. And this is what how they responded. Unfortunately, as everyone who frequents this site knows, Nikon USA has been remarkably reluctant, diplomatic, eh, to put this camera in retailers' hands. The result in this particular case is that had we left the order open, we'd still be sitting on your money and would have been unable to fulfill the D200 order and it's reasonable to presume you'd be chafing to get your camera and which we'd have been and are unable to supply due to circumstances beyond our control we regret and apologize for having vexed you so here was Scott's response Lynn steps B&H and they came into the forum and said basically you're right we screwed you but then explained what happened apologized and said that B&H will make it right. By acknowledging the issue, one guy with one post changed the whole tone of the thread and the reputation of B&H. After that, the post changed 
and became incredibly positive. So there's the power of monitoring and responding like a human being on a social media site. So you need to find the places where people are discussing you and you need to monitor what they're saying and actively participate. If those spaces aren't available, if they're not in existence, then maybe you need to create that space and become the information central for your industry, for your product, for your service, whatever category you're in. Um, it's just good to be there, to be present, and to be proactively providing information.